professional or attorney before making any real estate or financial decisions. Please remember when following advice, your results may vary. And all information covered here is not intended to cover all aspects of the subject material, but rather a sample of issues the hosts and guests consider important. Suffice it to say that officer. And now, Real Estate Talk with your host, Victoria Rivadinera. Each week, Victoria gathers some of the best minds in the business to provide both professionals and non-professionals with the inside tips and tools to make smarter deals. Whether you're a buyer or seller, Real Estate Talk will give you the competitive advantage you need. And now, here's Victoria Rivadinera. Thank you and welcome to Real Estate Talk. We live video stream from New York's iHeart Studios, WOR AM 710 on Facebook.com forward slash Victoria R-I-V-A every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our show also airs on AM 710 every Sunday morning, and our podcast can be found on retalkradio.com. I'm Victoria Ribadonera, and I'm here today with co-host Lior Aldad. How Hello are you there. today? All right, fantastic. Yeah, we have a great show today. I'm looking forward, I agree. Yeah, very interesting show. Fascinating topic also, and great great things to learn about. Well, they say that real estate builds wealth. Right, I agree with them. You do agree, right? I agree. It's the fastest way to grow and, and best way to invest uh, for the last few years at least. That's what I'm hearing. Yep. <laughs> so. so we have today a very, very special guest. We actually have two guests, um, and uh, my... First guest that I want to introduce is Matt Barbaccia, and I know Matt for a really long time. And when I first met Matt, you know, he was a commercial broker, and we had a very long discussion about residential real estate, and he gave me all the reasons why commercial is really where you should be putting your money. So I just want to give you a little bit of history on Matt. Um, Matt uh, operates and owns a portfolio of over 50 buildings, 2,000 units throughout New York City and Westchester County, New York. He has originated financing. He's advised on acquisition and uh, disposition and management of over $650 million worth of investment properties. Wow, that's very impressive. Isn't that impressive? Yes. Uh, he is also the, uh, a partner and man a managing partner and a development company uh, called Ramco. And he also is involved with ABSLending.com, which is a hard money bridge lender that's based out of New York and Florida. Matt, I want to thank you very much for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you guys for having me down here. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, we, we are really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. You obviously have been highly successful in everything that you touch, and I'm very impressed with everything that you do, and I, I'm also very happy to call you one of my friends. Thank you very much. Same here. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we also have with us today, Lior. Oh, I have to follow that intro? You have to follow that intro. You do. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You can handle that <laughs> intro. Uh, one of the most impressive people I know, John Laterra. Uh, and John is also a co-host, so many of our listeners may recognize this name, even though sometimes I call him Joe, but <laughs> he is John. Uh, John Laterra is um, an attorney, first and foremost, um, and a co-host on this show. And John has over 17 years of legal experience and over 25 years of experience in investment management, real estate debt origination, acquisition, as well as equity investing. Um, John also founded and has successfully managed two financing firms worth well over $100 million. So this is a very, very impressive person that we have here in the studio as well to follow Matt's introduction. Uh, I am thrilled to have both of them here, um, and I, I can go on and on about John. I mean, his bio is so long, but I do want to just point out a few things. John also teaches at Pace University. Uh, he is an adjunct professor at Pace University School of Law. He's also a veteran. Um, he is a, a member of the U.S. Marine Corps, which is amazing. Thank you very much for your service. My pleasure. Thank you. And John has um, also, man he manages a hedge fund, um, and he has been the recipient of Pace University School of Law's Leadership Award. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I All look right? forward to it as well. So both 
introductions are just over the top impressive. So this is amazing. We have them both in the studio with us, Leo. How, how exciting is this? That, that is that is a wealth of information and incredible people here. So. Yes, and forgive me for reading the intro. I just didn't want to miss too much because they're just such amazing people. But here's my first question. I'm going to ask you, uh, Matt, because when we first met, I remember meeting you and having the conversation about residential real estate versus commercial real estate. Yep. And a lot of people don't realize that they are very, very different. What are your thoughts on that? And how can you explain to our audience how different they are and the whole process of it being different? Yeah, you know, the residential side of the business and uh, the commercial side are, are two very, very different things, just like you said, Victoria. And uh, when I reference re residential side of the business, I, I'm more thinking of, you know, single family homes. And when I reference commercial, I'm thinking of everything from multifamily, say four units plus, to retail strips, office buildings, student housing. And uh, everything is different about them from the financing available for these two different product types to the due diligence required when. Uh, looking into purchasing these different types of assets, um, as well as operating these assets. Uh, it's very different. Uh, I think commercial is a, a great place if, if purchased correctly and due diligence is done correctly um, that could really help to, to build wealth in, in a very safe fashion. Yeah, I, I agree. Your thoughts, John? I think Matt hit the nail on the head. He's 100% correct. Um, you may want to add to the... Uh one family house on the residential side, the condominium apartments that people buy, and I'm not I'm not talking about somebody who's buying bulk condo apartment units or co-op units or buying from a sponsor a floors or being a developer, but I'm talking about uh, a single unit where somebody would reside in. So that would, that would fall under the residential sector. Correct. And the co-op apartment as well, which is shares of stock of a corporation that owns the... Uh, the building and you're a shareholder of that particular unit that also falls under the residential. But I agree with you that there's a huge distinction between uh, buying residential versus buying commercial. Uh, if you are not going to live there and uh, you're going to use it for investment purposes to rent it out, most of the times you are, you are under the commercial sector, the commercial division of the market. And then if you're planning to reside and move in and live there, you are most likely in the in the uh, residential. You know, I think the intrinsic value of owning any type of real estate, whether it's a residential, single family homes, a condo, co op, to you know, a hundred unit multifamily property or retail strip, uh, has great value and just the intrinsic value of parking your money and as a hedge against, a hedge against inflation. And uh, on the residential side, you know, you have the appreciation play, and you also you know, can on the plain devil's advocate can sort of look at it like a glorified savings account where like, you know, you're the one contributing to paying that mortgage on a given month. We're on a commercial property. Uh, you still have the appreciation play. You have um, some additional aspects of, you know, write offs and depreciation that also factor and can be very powerful. But you also have the tenants that you have in those properties that are helping to pay your mortgage as well. So it, it's a great opportunity to be able to scale into a larger asset where you know you, maybe you can't purchase a home that's a million dollars, two million dollars, although that'd be very nice for everybody. But but maybe purchasing a commercial property that's worth a million dollars, two million dollars is very attainable with the the financing options out there. So and, Matt, I, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to add one thing. I I think Matt, I was trying not to jump ahead, but it's good that you did. One of the main determinations and where that determination I feel becomes most significant is with respect to financing. So financing commercial is very, very different than financing residential. How so? Well, for instance, as Matt alluded to, in residential, you're not using income, even if you're renting that residential unit out in an effort to get that mortgage in your ratios, your DSCR, and all your different ratios, whereas in commercial property, you could actually utilize the rent as income in order to gain more favorable rates with respect to your mortgage. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. Also, with respect to commercial, you're eliminating much of the regulatory constraints that most of the residential markets have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, on the commercial side, they, they really consider it more of an asset-based lending type atmosphere where they're, they're really relying on the, the fundamental principles of that particular property that you're purchasing, on, purchasing and not weighing it as much on the individual that is borrowing the money. Obviously, they're going to look at that, but... Uh, where like in a single family house, it really is uh, vastly determined based on the strength of the borrower. Obviously, you know, they're going to do other types of checks and balances in terms of appraisals and other types of home inspections to make sure that things are in line. Um, but uh, 
relying just on the fundamentals of the asset uh, really can help people really leverage up, like I mentioned before. And especially, especially in a first-time home buyer, right? If you're planning to move in and live in, live in the apartment or in the house, and you're a first-time home buyer, you're able to get it secure a loan much more easily than a person who uh, is buying it for investment. And you're correct. The, the analysis is completely different, and, and the way that the banks are evaluating the product as to and the person as well, but the product is completely different between a commercial and a uh, residential. Uh, now, notwithstanding the fact that in a residential you can get a pre-approval letter uh, that you are qualified to move in, in the commercial sector uh, you can, but it's uh, again the the building, the income, the asset is uh, much more heavily looked upon and evaluated than the person himself as whether or not he or she can pay back the loan. And one of the, the big determinations, which John referenced before, is the uh, uh, debt coverage ratio. Uh, if, maybe if you want to just touch on that and how does a bank factor that in and when determining how much money they're going to lend. Yeah, absolutely. If, effectively, what banks do is they take all the income and they take the mortgage and the interest rate and how much that mortgage, and, and I'm trying to, to kind of word it so that everybody understands, so they take all of that information, they put it together in a ratio. Most banks like to see a one-to-two ratio. That's, no, that's called the DSCR, the, de- the debt service coverage ratio. Banks take that into account before they give a loan, and they take that number, and effectively what they want to see with respect to the ratio is how much of the income is being spent to pay the debt service. That so, makes sense, yep. And, and also, just another very important point that I know each of you have touched on, I wanted to just bring it home, is with respect to the asset-based lending, one of the attractive parts that I always found about commercial or borrowing against a commercial parcel, a commercial piece of property, is also that you may, depending on the LTV or the loan-to-value, you may be able to negotiate, negotiate out full recourse, which means you will not be personally liable if... You don't pay back the loan. I agree. But, but since since you brought the uh, loan to value, I think it's important to stress to people who are entering the commercial sector and the commercial division that unlike in the residential where you can borrow up to 80% customarily, that's not happening in the commercial um, side. In the commercial side, I think usually 60 to 70%. Is, what do you say, John? I, I agree with you. So what we're seeing now on the commercial side, Right. Most lenders want to see about 50 to 60 percent. I'm 60, sorry, 50 right? to 60 percent LTV, right. so they want the equity sponsor to come up with 30 or 40 percent. Depending on that loan to value right. also will depend on whether it's full recourse or non-recourse. And oh, you without could, a doubt. Yes. And you could play with that a bit. So what we have seen more often than not, depending on that loan to value and those ratios, we're able to negotiate full recourse and basically back into something known as bad boy carve-outs, which means that you'll only be liable if you're engaging in some sort of fraud or the bank finds out of some sort of fraud, and that's why they, that's how it comes up with the name bad boy carve-outs. So yeah. you're only liable if right, there's I, a fraud. Yeah, so I, I've done the same thing with my clients, and I represented clients who bought in the commercial buildings, commercial sector, and yes, we, we negotiated the bad boy at first, the bank, just to tell you a story, the bank wanted the full recourse. We tried to ask for none, and then the halfway meeting in the middle trying to amicably reach a resolution was the bad boy uh, part, the carve out, which my client agreed. But, you know, it was worth it for him to agree and proceed forward than to try to say, no, 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 and, and I'm not taking the loan because of me being somewhat, some way liable. Yeah, one of the other things that I'm seeing right now is that the, uh, in terms of the not only the prepayment, pay, prepayment penalties, you're sometimes able to negotiate because a typical con- uh, commercial loan, say if it's a five-year term and you know amortized over 25 years, at the end of five years, you're either uh, refinancing or you're going to either sell the building at that point, and most people at that point refinance. Um, and sometimes during that five-year period, most of the loans were you have like a five four three two one penalty, which uh, five four three two one. Uh, prepayment penalty, and sometimes on longer terms you are able to negotiate that where uh, your window of opportunity to get out of, the, out of that particular loan earlier um, is a lot easier. So maybe if there's like a 10-year term, instead of it being, um, you know, uh, say five five four four three three two two one one, you know, you might be able to do it where the last two years of that particular loan you do have the flexibility to get out. 
I think it's important, I don't mean to jump in, no. but I think it's important to tell the audience that in a residential loan, there is no prepayment penalty. For the most part, correct. Well, there right. could be. There could be, but 99% of the, of the transactions. Very rare. Very rare for the, yes, for the residential. So, yes, I agree with you about, um, about that part where in a commercial loans, you have the 54321 prepayment penalties. I had a case many years ago where the seller uh, signed a contract and then set the closing on purpose. So he's going to hit the 1%, which is the last year of the, of the five-year term, uh, so he can pay only 1% prepayment penalty in lieu of. So when we do a contract negotiations and, and setting closing dates, we look at the mortgage, we see exactly what dates are the call vows for the 54321 prepayment penalties. And then even though we enter into a contract on a particular date, we choose on purpose a deferred closing date to eliminate paying another percentage on uh, the uh, prepayment penalties. From from your guys' perspective, are you seeing when it comes to recourse loans and the the banks requiring them, um, how receptive have the banks been to you guys uh, to implement a burn off period, where instead of the loan being personally guaranteed for the length of the loan after a certain amount of years, the recourse either disappears or the uh, the you know, amount of recourse is limited. Well, here's how I'll answer that: as as deleveraging and refinancings continue. Yield expectations are changing. So what I mean by that is real estate is, is now operating more like the vehicle it was meant to operate, like not before the global financial crisis, but afterwards, post-financial crisis. With that being said, most banks want to see full recourse, and I think most borrowers are prone to accept a full recourse. And with a full recourse, you could obviously get much better terms from a bank, and that's what with that's effectively what we are seeing in our practice, even in our fund. If we want to negotiate out the full recourse and the personal liability, there may be a premium for that. And it just depends on the borrower's appetite for risk at that point. Are they more risk adverse or are they more prone to John, take that premium? John, when, you say, when you're referring to a better terms, are you referring to a better interest rate? Are you referring to better better uh, loan to value and higher loan amount or are you referring to all the above or are you referring to the well, prepayment the penalties above. well it really depends right it depends on the particular situation right. maybe interest rates not that important because you know that there's an exit strategy or a liquidation strategy okay. at the end of 18 months therefore prepayment penalties become much more important rather than interest rate it, it it's very hard for me to sit here and tell you exactly what the situation right. would be without knowing the situation. Right, because every single situation uh, is different. Well, and to Matt's point, every commercial transaction is very different. It's not like a residential check-the-box type financing. It's very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. I agree. I'll tell you a trick that I've learned uh, practicing in real estate law about commercial transactions with prepayment penalties. You know how you borrow... Uh, Five years plus a five-year extension, and then you have a five, four, three, two, one payoff, and another five, four, three, two, one payoff. Well, whoever represented the client who came to us failed to have a last twenty-five days or last month without prepayment penalties. So, my client who was planning to refinance after five years had to pay a one percent because there was no window for him to refinance and secure new mortgage. Have you seen that? You know what I'm talking about? Well, I've seen some loans where even if you have a five-year term, even at the end of that term, no matter what, they still charge a point as an exit. Exactly. Uh, so what, mm -hmm. I did, what I did with another client is that I negotiated a window of two weeks where you can pay off the loan without, while, no, towards the end of the five years, before it ex extends and renews without any prepayment penalties, giving the client the, the ability to refi or pay off the loan. Otherwise, I think, I think it's a trick of the trade of the banks, taking it all the way to the last day and then still. I think everything is really a play on the numbers, and you know, sometimes uh, a particular borrower just wants to hear, you know what, the interest rate is this, and that's, they're just fixated on that particular number, but you really need to take a step back and look at the whole picture in terms of points. You need to look at your closing costs, I and mean, there's some commercial lenders right now that have are, are doing no no appraisal fee, no bank attorney fee, 
uh, no application fee. And if you look at the cost on this on a loan, that could be several million dollars. I mean, it adds up very quickly. It could be easily well north of twenty thousand dollars. So, like, if you bury that cost into the uh, to the to the the interest rate and the the cost of the loan over a period of time, you know, it's a your, your total payout can be a lot higher than what it appears to Absolutely. be on the surface. Well, when we come back, we're going to dive into this a little bit more and, and talk about more of the financing and maybe even some alternative financing methods that are currently in play. Uh, I'm Victoria Rivadonera. I am here with Lior Eldad, co-hosting Real Estate Talk, live from um, iHeart Studios, WOR. We are speaking with John Laterra and Matt Barbaccia, and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Tom Marinero, the president of Residential Home Funding, a top East Coast mortgage company. Now is the time to buy a home before interest rates go up. Lock in with a low rate today or turn your current home into an asset by cashing in on its equity. Why rent when you can own? Why not get cash out of your home now? So call me right now at 1-800-636-LEND. And as a bonus, if you call me right now, I will waive all of my lender fees. That's right, zero lender fees saving you thousands of dollars. This offer is for purchasing or refinancing a home. Call me and learn more at 1-800-636-LEND. Residential funding is part of the New York and New Jersey Departments of Banking and Insurance. Our NMLS number is 36152. The number once again is 1-800-636-LEND. That's 1-800-636-LEND. This is Paul Oster, the nation's credit repairman, and I want to help you improve your credit. As the CEO of Better Qualified, I've helped thousands of people over the past 10 years. I'm the credit expert for Fox Business News and all the major networks. I'm a certified FICO pro that uses the consumer laws to help delete negative information off of credit reports. We have a debt elimination program that focuses on the laws surrounding collections, judgments, and charge-offs. You could be entitled to up to $1,000 per violation. Call now for your free credit consultation, 888-533-8138. That number again, 888-533-8138. Or visit us on the web at betterqualified.com. Every loan has a story, a family, and a dream that fuels it. My name is Jacqueline Sendra, mortgage loan originator number 39117, specializing in first-time homebuyer financing and an array of mortgage products. We recognize the importance of competitive rates and a custom-tailored mortgage loan to suit your needs. United Northern Mortgage Bankers LTD celebrates over 37 years of mortgage banking success. Allow us to help you achieve your dream of home ownership by reaching out to me today at 631-478-2706. Again, 631-478-2706. United Northern Mortgage Lenders LTD, NMLS number 7230, is an equal housing lender and a licensed mortgage banker located at 3601 Hempstead Turnpike Suite 300, Levittown, New York, 11756, New York State Department of Financial Services. For more real estate talk, download our free podcast at retalkradio.com. Now back to Victoria Rivadinera. And we're back. We are here with Matt Barbaccia and John Laterra, and I am here with Lior co-hosting Real Estate Talk. If you're tuning in right now, you can go to our website at retalkradio.com for the podcast and listen at your convenience for the entire show. Uh, we were talking about commercial investing, and we were talking about some financing before we went to the break. And um, what I want to do is I want to simplify this just a little bit for some of our listeners that are new to commercial real estate. And for those who are looking to invest in commercial real estate, before we go into the financing side of it, can you just walk us through the process and why they would need you as a, as a commercial broker to represent them? Yeah, I, I think whether, you know, uh, the, the broker is a very key component to any transaction, just like the attorney is, just like the inspector is. And, and you really want a good broker so that way you can rely on that particular person to be the expert, not only in that area that you're looking to purchase in, but also on that product type. Because the broker that specializes in, say, retail strips in, you know, you know, uh, in say Long Island, you know, probably is not the person to go to if you're looking to buy a multifamily property in, you know, the Upper East Side. It's just a, a different type of valuation, different type of financing and all that. And you really want to rely on this person to that not only knows, knows the marketplace so they can give you essentially a, really what you want is a roadmap to, you know, I purchase it for this. Here are some options of what you can do to increase the rents, maybe lower the expenses, maybe reposition the asset and then that broker should have a good idea if you do a b and c you know here's your exit strategy you could either a refinance pull out some money from the property or, or sell that particular um, asset for you know roughly around this price so 
you know, I think that's very, very, very important. I think finding a broker that's honest and gives you the exact precise information is vital and critical for any prospective buyer. You have to find a reliable uh, broker that will tell you the facts as they are and the broker that does his due diligence. For example, I had a case uh, many years ago where the broker failed to find out that one of the tenants in the commercial building had a right of first refusal. And I was not aware of that. My client was not aware of that. Um, he went and gave an offer. He looked at the deal summary sheet. He did all his homework and everything, only to find out that when I received as a lawyer the uh, tenant's leases, and I went over all the leases, I found out that, hey, the tenant on the ground floor has a right of first refusal to buy the entire building for the same price and terms. That's huge. If you are a buyer and you go through all your your due diligence and you retain the services of an attorney only to find out at that junction that the tenant on the ground floor may exercise his right of first refusal uh, is, is tremendous. So I really think finding or a broker that tells you that, oh, the, the current taxes are X amount and then you find out that they are not, that turns around your entire uh, calculations on expenses. What, what, do you th- what do you think, John? Have well, you that seen- goes to, to saying that you need somebody who is, number one, local to the market, number two, very knowledgeable. And before we go to John, I know you just uh, posed a question to him. I want to just ask Matt, how do you find that broker? You know, I think one good method is, you know, whose name do you see out there all the time? You know, who's the person that's, you know, active in that marketplace, whether you see them writing different types of press releases, whether they're, um, you know, being featured just for selling particular properties. Yeah, you know, I, I always like to think the one that's spending the money on advertising, all that stuff is probably the one making the most money in that marketplace because if they weren't making Because advertising money, isn't cheap. Yeah, <laughs> it's not cheap. They probably <laughs> wouldn't have the money to do so. So I think that's like a good way to go about it. And I think also just word of mouth. You know, uh, you know. They just think about how you got interested in the marketplace. Maybe you have a family member or a friend that's in that particular business. Maybe they can recommend you to somebody. And you know, it's, it could be either like your your ultimate solution, or it could just be a starting point to to learn a little bit more and try to see who you mesh with well. Okay, thank you. And um, I know Lior gave you a question. I so rudely <laughs> interrupted. No, so that's I'm going to pass it over to you now. That's okay. All great points. I I've learned over the years that at least in my opinion, real estate covers a lot of different domains. It, it clearly requires thinking and an understanding of economics. So poker can only enhance each and every one of those aspects of figuring out a particular parcel of real estate. It's not just looking at an asset, checking the NOI or the net operating income. It's a lot more to it. There is a lot to it. And it's, again, very different than residential. With residential, people are buying on emotion and then justifying with logic. But in commercial, they're buying on logic, and they need somebody who's really going to guide them to know what, the, what this property really has to offer. I think that if you rely on projected income or projected rents in, in a commercial building that is currently vacant, without doing your own homework uh, is a disservice because the brokers like to project optimistically and as you see what's happening in the retail sector of, of the economy, uh, stores are empty. So if you are thinking that you're going to buy this and the landlord who owns the building hasn't, doesn't know what he's doing, and in fact tomorrow morning you're going to be renting it, and not only renting it but renting it at what the broker is projecting, make sure that what he's projecting is accurate and give a gap time. That, that's a great point. The amount of U.S. macroeconomic data that is available before getting into any transaction is tremendous. You could literally find out the growth rate, the growth potential, everything, even with respect to transportation, roads, everything nowadays. There's no shortage of data. There's no shortage of data. There's so much information out there these days, without a doubt. And and I think also if you're you're purchasing a property and say that particular property is, uh, you know, a retail strip like you you mentioned – you know, maybe reach out to local uh, leasing brokers that are leasing places in the area and sort of pick their brain, you know, what they're seeing out there. You know, you don't always have to rely on that one person. Maybe the person that's helping with the purchase, their core competency is just on the transactional side of, and, and selling buildings or, you know, retail strips. But, you know, if you're looking at stores and trying to figure out, you know what, <coughs> I'm buying this retail strip, there's only 18 months left on the lease, and this is uh, like a big box store, 
you know, maybe it's uh, one of these bigger department stores they're not doing so well. Like, what are the chances of me getting someone else in there? Can they afford to pay the same rent? You know, d- you know do your homework. You know, definitely do your research. I think it all falls down on the something known as due diligence. That's the magic word. You better do and you have to do your own due diligence and, and be as thorough as you can and, and make sure you, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's as much as possible. If it's environmental in the commercial division, as you know, John, the bank will want to do an environmental search and make sure that the, uh, that the uh, building or the land is environmentally sound. Um, so make sure that your lawyer will put a clause in the contract saying subject to an environment, a clean environmental uh, report. And if it's an engineer's report uh, that you want to do before you sign a contract, make sure you hire a, a good engineer to give you the information. Because after all, you're buying it as is condition, and you are uh, in charge of your own homework. And last but not least, obviously, is that you make sure you hire and retain the services of a wise, intelligent, savvy, shrewd lawyer who is zealously is going to advocate for your rights. Oh, yes. thank, thank you for that. <laughs> I, I, I know two of them right here. <laughs> and yes, that is a very good point. You do need the team. You know, the broker and the attorney really has to know commercial real estate. They both have to be very well versed in this. And one of the big mistakes that I constantly see, especially from the management perspective, is people will approach you to manage an asset after they already have it under contract. And, and these people will sometimes come to you and you're, you're, you're sitting there on the other side of the table looking at them and you're saying, you know, I can't help you with this. Like, you know, you and, and it, but it's too late at that point because they already have their money tied up. It could be a hard deposit that they can't get their money back. So I think another wise thing to do is when you're going out there and starting your search, in addition to talking to all these different parties that we spoke about, uh, if you're not going to operate it yourself, or even if you are going to operate yourself, I think it's wise to consult with people who are operating that type of asset in that local area. Because at the end of the day, they do not want to take on an assignment that's not going to be profitable because you're not going to be able to pay them. You're not going to be able to pay your vendors, and, and it's really going to make life absolutely miserable for them. So there's not that much of an incentive for them to take on a project like that. Man, and I think it just, creates that checks and balances. You just used the term hard money, deposit. Can you distinguish and define for the audience what's the difference between a soft deposit and a hard deposit? Sure. So... Um, on a single family home, typically there are mortgage contingencies where the uh, the deal is so a, a person signs a contract they put down say they 're five percent ten percent whatever is customary for that particular marketplace if the uh, that particular person cannot get financing, they can back out based on the mortgage contingency clause get their deposit back if the appraisal doesn 't come in correctly uh, if the appraisal doesn 't come in based on the number that they sign the contract, they can back out get their deposit based on that. Um, on, ter- on a lot of commercial deals, what happens is when you sign the contract, there are no financing contingencies. Uh, you're buying the property as is in a lot of situations where once you sign that contract and you put down your 5%, 10%, whatever it is, uh, you really do not have a, a method to get that money back if you decide afterwards that you don't want to move forward with that particular transaction. And you find that a lot of people face the the, the big question of, you know, does it make sense to close on it and try to figure out from there or just walk away from the money and, and uh, that they put up that contract. And, I, and, I, and I've seen it go both ways. It really just depends on you know what the downside really is. So on this topic, John said that banks are looking for, you said, what, 40 to 50 percent? Right? What happens if... In the, the commercial market. In the commercial market. So let's say this is a great property. Everything makes sense, but I don't have enough money to do this. What would you suggest? How, how can we buy this property? Oh, it's a great question. There's a couple of different methods of going about it. Number one, you could try to get a subordinate financing, subordinate lending, or a MES piece, which effectively is a, is a piece of debt that sits between the equity and the senior lender. So that MES piece will obviously be at a higher yield. There's a premium for the MES piece taking additional risk sitting behind a senior lender. An alternative method may be just try to find an equity partner or a preferred equity, so to speak. You could bring in a preferred equity partner. And what that, are your thoughts on that? Do you recommend that? There's also, <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you a third one oh, before wait, you wait, respond. Wait, wait. I want to know. I want to know what his thoughts <laughs> are. <laughs> equity partner? Go yes. ahead. My, I, my, my thought would be, yes, I, I would entertain as a lawyer and as an investor, I would entertain a preferred equity piece if I can also have the mezzanine or the senior debt piece. So what I'm saying is as long as I control the entire capital stack, 
then I would feel much more comfortable. Okay. As far as just taking that preferred equity piece or just taking even that MES piece, the only way I would get comfortable is if I had the correct intercreditor agreements without getting too complicated mm -hmm. or have the correct membership interest agreements with the sponsors. Yeah, I agree with John. I think a strategic partner makes a lot of sense. But I once heard the phrase and someone said, you know, if partners were so good, why doesn't God have a partner? So you got to ask yourself, you know, sometimes oh, it's wow, cheaper to pay the higher interest rate because, you know, you, I also heard the expression, you know, they say, you know, it's cheaper than partners. So, yeah, you might be paying a double digit interest rate, but, you know, it's cheaper than having, you know, someone else that's not doing so, anything or doing all the work, right. not adding any value, etc. I agree. Now, I'll give you a third, a third scenario, which my brother uh, purchased a piece of commercial property a few years back, and he utilized a, a concept called purchase money mortgage which means that the seller gives a loan to the buyer with certain terms. The seller records a mortgage, and the buyer... So basically, the seller, in essence, becomes the bank, and the seller lends to the buyer that difference of 60% or 70%, whatever it is, above and beyond the down payment. Now, the, the issue we always see with purchase money mortgages is either the senior or the MES lender will not allow it. No, be, be there, is no there is no other lender. It's a straight, it's a straight, let's, let's say I was selling my building for $5 million. Oh, so you're, you're off of Victoria's scenario. You're on your own new scenario. Correct. <laughs> <Okay>. Sorry. <laughs> I'm still on the old scenario. The no, I, I, gave, I gave you the third option. So you, you guys <laughs> mentioned about, about the partnership. You, gave, you mentioned about a second mortgage. You to make sure you're paying attention, John. That's okay. And then the third, a third option I would think to pursue and be able to secure and buy a commercial property would be an idea of whether or not the seller is willing to give the purchaser a, his own loan against the lien, first lien against the property. Mm -hmm. So that, that, can be, that can work for somebody who is short on... Yeah, I've seen it work in a lot of situations, especially if maybe the, the asset is not very financeable in its current state. Um, you know, the, where the seller already sort of knows the headaches and what's at hand, it, it creates a good opportunity where maybe they can stretch out from the seller side, you know, a little extra proceeds by giving the financing to the person purchasing it. And from the borrower's, borrower's perspective, um, a lot of times that rate that you're getting from the seller is a lot cheaper than going to alternative financing solutions. And uh, it, it gives them the opportunity to get into the deal. There's less uh, scrutiny over different types of items. And maybe in a year from now, two years, three years from now, whatever the terms of the seller financing are, uh, they could either refinance out with a conventional loan um, that's cheaper or has more favorable terms. Okay, so Matt, let's say I want to invest in commercial property for the very first time. What would you recommend? What would I recommend? Good question. I think a lot of it depends on two things. One, obviously capital. You know, how much capital are you looking to put into this particular asset? And that's and when and that can't be looked at just from the purchase, also as an ongoing thing, depending on how much work the particular property needs. And then also your time commitment. You know, how much time do you want to dedicate to this? Are you um, do you have some sort of other career where your time is very limited and you know you you can't afford to be at the building every day, every other day? Um, you know, so I think that has to really be weighed into it. Um, I, I think one of the the, the great methods, if you, you have, call it $50,000 or even less, uh, depending on your marketplace, is you can purchase, say, a two-family, three-family, four-family and get financing based on you owner-occupying one of the, those units in that property, and then you have the income stream from the other unit. So maybe if you're buying a single-family house or apartment, you're only able to get approved for, say, $150,000 uh, worth of a purchase price. But if you're buying a three-family that maybe goes for 400000 500000 based on the fact that you have the income from those other units, you can buy a much larger asset. So now you have the, the tenants in your property are, are helping to pay down a much larger mortgage. You still have the appreciation play. And at some point down the road, assuming you pay off the mortgage, you have a nice cash flow stream coming in. Okay. So I have another question, but we're, we're going to go to break. So when we come back, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the market, the current market right now. Is this a good time to buy? Is it not a good time to buy? Should we wait? I don't know. Good We're, question. Don't answer it yet. We're going to hear from you as soon as we come back, and I'm going to have John jump in on that as well because we, uh, we have this conversation quite often. I am Victoria Rivadonera. You are listening to Real Estate Talk from WOR iHeart Studios. Every loan has a story, a family, and a dream that fuels it. 
My name is Jacqueline Sendra, mortgage loan originator number 39117, specializing in first-time homebuyer financing and an array of mortgage products. We recognize the importance of competitive rates and a custom-tailored mortgage loan to suit your needs. United Northern Mortgage Bankers LTD celebrates over 37 years of mortgage banking success. Allow us to help you achieve your dream of home ownership by reaching out to me today at 631-478-2706. Again, 631-478-2706. United Northern Mortgage Lenders LTD, NMLS number 7230, is an equal housing lender and a licensed mortgage banker located at 3601 Hempstead Turnpike Suite 300, Levitt. New York 11756 New York State Department of Financial Services. This is Paul Oster, the nation's credit repairman, and I want to help you improve your credit. As the CEO of Better Qualified, I've helped thousands of people over the past 10 years. I'm the credit expert for Fox Business News and all the major networks. I'm a certified FICO pro that uses the consumer laws to help delete negative information off of credit reports. We have a debt elimination program that focuses on the laws surrounding collections, judgments, and charge-offs. You could be entitled to up to $1,000 per violation. Call now for your free credit consultation, 888-533-8138. That number again, 888-533-8138, or visit us on the web at betterqualified.com. Hi, this is Tom Marinero, the president of Residential Home Funding, a top East Coast mortgage company. Now is the time to buy a home before interest rates go up. Lock in with a low rate today or turn your current home into an asset by cashing in on its equity. Why rent when you can own? Why not get cash out of your home now? So call me right now at 1-800-636-LEND. And as a bonus, if you call me right now, I will waive all of my lender fees. That's right, zero lender fees saving you thousands of dollars. This offer is for purchasing or refinancing a home. Call me and learn more at 1-800-636-LEND. Residential funding is part of the New York and New Jersey Departments of Banking and Insurance. Our NMLS number is 36152. The number, once again, is 1-800-636-LEND. That's 1-800-636-LEND. RETalkRadio.com is your portal for cutting-edge information to give you an advantage in the competitive real estate market. Now, back to Real Estate Talk with Victoria Rivadinera. And we're back. We are here in the studio with Matt Barbaccia and John Laterra and Lior Aldad here um, co-hosting with me. And before we went to break, Matt, I asked the question to you. Uh, we all know that real estate is cyclical. You know, Tell us where we are right now. Is this a good time to buy, or should we wait? So, so unfortunately, nobody has a crystal ball, so nobody knows whether now is a good time or now is a bad time. I think market-wise, we are definitely you know, recovered from the um, housing crisis, so um, you know, I think that's uh, slightly alarming. But I think, generally speaking, there's you know, it's good to always buy. There's never a bad time to buy. It's just people buy bad deals in that particular marketplace. So I think if you know what to look for and you know how to create value, you can buy throughout any cycle. Would you agree that real estate is a long-term investment when you're looking at, at buying something? 100%. Yeah, it's a long-term investment. I think at a, at a bare minimum, you want to try to, you know, broad stroking it, you know, be involved for like at least five years to seven years. Okay. So it was a five to seven year cycle. But as Matt said, just to chime in, there's no crystal ball. So all you can do is look at historical data, which at our firm we're constantly looking at data. And it seems like right now, just to kind of sum it up, at least where we are, we're in about the 92nd month of the upturn cycle since the recession. So historically speaking, if you look back at cycles dating back to World War II, as I'm sure you know, most people in the real estate industry know a typical cycle is 58 months. That's the average real estate cycle. However, that same data shows you that over the last half century, the length of cycles have been lengthening. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're they increase. longer. Yes. Great example, 1980, it was a 92-month cycle. In 1990, I believe the cycle was 120 months. So with that being said, obviously, being in the 92nd month of this cycle, we're definitely in the mature stages of the cycle. But we're but, still in it. We're still in it. I mean, I mean, obviously, even with that being said, right, even the U.S. macroeconomic data shows, shows that we're going to be in it for a bit longer, right? I mean, real GDP is strong mm -hmm. at 2%. Job growth is at 1.7%. And the Federal Reserve has been extremely cautious with interest rates. So I tell you, I think from my experience, what are you going to do 
different than what it's currently. He wanted to, to enjoy that appreciation on the shorter term and not just ride the coattail of the market. What are you going to do different that uh, currently is not existing? Like, for example, uh, I know many of my clients buy a, a commercial rental building and they plan to convert it into a condominium uh, luxury apartments. Okay? So he's going to, that investor is going to convert, change, modify the use or modify the product. I had another guy who bought a single, single floor uh, shopping center and decided to build, it was worth it for him to build a second floor to increase the income. Uh, again, what are you going to do that currently does not exist if you are seeking that short-term return on investment with a profit? Um, I'll tell you a story. Many years ago, a client of mine bought a, part, uh, a townhouse uh, on Upper Manhattan, and I couldn't believe the amount of money he paid for it at that time. And I looked at my friends and I said, wow, I can't believe somebody just paid so much money. Well, that person, right, uh, did a complete regat restoration slash restoration for the townhouse. He sold it within a year and a half for $1 million more than what he bought it uh, with profit. So, again, you look at the product, you have a vision, you see what you want to make off it, how you want to change it, and then you execute. That's assuming you just don't want to sit back and ride the coattail of any prospective appreciation of the market. Yeah, I think, I think for people that are just starting to get into the commercial industry and you know, uh, you know, are watching these different flipping shows on TV and getting all excited and say, oh, this looks so easy, these people are making all this money, I think they need to really be very, very cautious and uh, really surround themselves with people who have done this before. You know, again, you, you, you know, I'll keep saying it, like you really need a good team behind you. And you know, if you look at the market, I mean, there are definitely people that are very uncertain as to where it's going, you know, based on interest rates um, that you know might increase over the next couple, you know, actually this summer that might go up again when the Fed meets. Um, you know, if you look at rent growth, you know, rents in most markets have increased. Although, like I've even seen some marketplaces here in Manhattan where the rents have actually decreased, and uh, and, and owners are offering concessions just to get tenants into those particular buildings. But the, the bottom, the, the real thing that you really need to look at is the NOI and like has the NOI, the net operating income, which is if you take your income and you subtract your expenses, what's left over at the end of the day, has that grown? And I think where we are in the marketplace is that the NOI for the most part has not grown. And if anything, that's getting tighter and tighter and tighter, which creates a big, you know, a little bit of a squeeze. And then if you have where interest rates spike up, you know, you have even more of a squeeze. So, you know, you really need to, uh, like Lior uh, mentioned really need to look at these assets with, you know, from like a different perspective, you know, take a step back and say, you know, how can I add value? Um, is there maybe, can you add to the existing building? Maybe there are large apartments that, and you know, a large two bedroom that you can turn into a three bedroom. Maybe a lease is coming up that's very under market and you can reposition it. Um, whatever it is, you know, I think to buy an asset based on, you know, what it is when you're, you know, of the day that you're purchasing and keep it like that, I think it's going to become, you know, or I shouldn't even say become it. It is very difficult to make it work. You know, and and what you're saying right now, too, is, is also about knowing your local market because real estate is local. So you said there are times you know, right here when we see rents that are going up and now we see rents that are coming down. You need to know that. You need to know that before going into something, what's going on in that local market, which really reiterates the reason that you need that good team around you. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if you get a set up for, say, a building in Manhattan and it might show you, okay, here's the rent per month and 12 months and here's the rent roll, but what you don't know is, well, maybe it doesn't matter as much that the rents have gone down because the rents that you see on there are, you know, assuming that they're somewhat stable right now. But one of the big things that's happening is that they're giving a, a one-month concession. So, you know, you might do your underwriting based on 12 months worth of income, but it's really 11, 11 months, months. Mm -hmm. assuming that person, you know, leaves at the end, you know, depending on what the turnover is in that local marketplace. But, you know, that's a huge percentage that you might not be factoring in. And maybe you're offering like an, another incentive in addition to that concession to get that person in there. And these are all added costs that really affect the bottom line and the net operating income of a particular property. Many times what the leases say and what the tenant actually pays are not, are not the same. In other words, you can look at a, uh, a deal sheet, summary sheet, and the leases are expected to pay X amount of dollars every month. But that particular tenant is struggling, and the landlord uh, is willing to accept a lower amount temporarily because he's struggling. But the, the term term temporarily is uh, to be defined and therefore uh you know what expected and what is is not always uh, in the same
What, so, one trend we see with respect to adding value, and I've seen it often in New York. It's much harder to do in New York, but have you heard of optionality? Which, in effect, the, the whole idea of optionality came from the whole office sharing space. So you need conceptual zoning, flexible zoning, which allows land owners or, or building owners, property owners, to have the option to use the highest and best use of the property for the specific tenant. So you're not necessarily locking a, a five-year tenant in with a five-year extension. You're giving them an option to change in order to have the highest and best use That's for your location. Interesting. Yeah. Are, are you not familiar with yeah, that? Yeah, not familiar with it. No. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that either. That is interesting. I'm seeing more and more of it. Yeah. So, John, as an attorney who has a wealth of experience uh, dealing with commercial what would you advise someone who is new to this, investing, they come to you, they're using Matt as their commercial broker? What, what's your advice to them? Well, the best advice I could give anyone is, is, as everyone had already alluded to, is you cannot ever do enough due diligence. Due diligence and run the numbers. The numbers do not lie. Mm -hmm. One of, the, one of the, the caveats, I would say, is be very careful with respect to cap rates. We've watched cap rates, especially Explain in Manhattan. The cap rate. A cap rate is effectively what you're making on your investment, and, I, and I'm really dumbing it down just to kind of mm -hmm. throw it out there. But a great example would be Manhattan would have historically traded at a 5 or 6% cap rate. We've historically watched that cap rate go from 6 to 5 to 4 to 3 to 2. I've, for the first time, witnessed a 1% cap rate, which is just insane. Now, obviously, Manhattan is a bit of an anomaly, so mm -hmm. you have to put it all into perspective. But be very careful with cap rates because right. you may think you're buying a building at a phenomenal loan to cost, but it could just be that you have a such an inflated cap rate that it still makes absolutely no sense. I think location, location, location. No matter what you do and how you slice it, if you're buying a corner property on 57th and 5th, that property will be nowhere near a, another property that is not in such a prime location. So... Location, 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 that statement holds true in commercial sector no matter where you are. It, it, it does. If I could just interject one moment. I'm, I'm, not, sure. I'm not saying I disagree with you. I, I completely no, agree with location. But it, it's also yield, yield, yield. What can, you could have the best location and make absolutely no money, but that particular investment would not necessarily make all the sense in the world. So we're looking at it strictly from yield, right? I mean, I you agree. could be in a hot market, but that also means that your prices are hot. So. Yeah, yeah, depending on whether it's an appreciation play or a yield play or, you know, per, in a perfect world, both of them. Um, but, yeah, I think, uh, you know, both statements can, you know, hold their, hold their weight. Are any of you seeing foreign investors buying property sight unseen? Not so much sight unseen. I mean, a lot of these foreign investors have huge teams, so maybe the, the key money person is, you know, overseas in a different country. Uh, but most of them have, like, a, someone here local on the grounds in, uh, in New York, wherever state you're in, that are at least touring the property on behalf of them. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have situations where brokers call me and they say that I represent uh, great leaders of different countries in the world or investors of different countries of the world, and they are the so-called agent. So... So, yes, they, the person has not seen it, but today with the Internet and the pho photography and, and Skype and, and Facebook Live, wink, wink, and, and all these other <laughs> channels of communication, um, people can, can be there without physically being there. Are you guys seeing any of your international clients that are having difficulty getting money here to the States? Most of my clients are buying all cash if they're international, so the funds get wired into. And, and by the way, now, now there is that new laws, right, mm -hmm. with... Uh, with the disclosure that you need to disclose if it's an all cash deal. Um, uh, that makes things, I think, in my, my opinion, uh, more protective, but uh, the laws have changed that you need to disclose where the money is coming from if it's not being wired or there's no mortgage involved, for international buyers, that is. Right. Okay. Uh, we are running out of time. Matt, I want to ask you one last question. You have had a tremendous amount of success. But I, I know with success comes some mistakes. What have some of your mistakes been? Oh, a lot of them. Tons and tons and tons of them. Like, uh, this could definitely be a whole different show. But, you know, I, I think one of the, the biggest ones is, uh, you know, really knowing, you know, and, and not even knowing, but being honest with yourself as to what you know and do best 
and just trying to stick to that. I think whenever I've tried to to veer off of that, you know, I've gotten myself into a little bit of trouble. Fortunately, you know, uh, you know, really being in focusing on this industry on the other aspects has 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 made it where the um, like the the downside that I faced, you know, was not greater than the upside. So I was fortunate, but uh, you can see what you know. Just stick to stick to what you know best, and and whatever you don't know, just rely on the other people. But this could be, you know, getting out of your marketplace. You know, I, you know, we've had it where you know we have our certain pockets that we constantly look to invest in, and we we know the players, we know everything about it, and are hundred percent confident. And you know, you sometimes find the the whole the grass is greener on the other side, and start to look in different markets, and you know, this looks beautiful and great on the surface, and as you dig into it. Uh, you realize, or hopefully that you actually do dig into it, you realize that it's not nearly as good as you once thought. So the one piece of advice you'd give our listeners? Is stay focused and uh, you know stick to what you know best. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. How does someone reach you? So um, you can reach me through our website. So uh, you can contact me at uh, abslending.com. Um, and my email is matt, M-A-T-T, at abslending.com. Thank you again. John, how do we reach you? Best way, email john, J-O-H-N, at L-M dot legal. Thanks. And Lior, I can't end the show without having everyone know how to reach you. Best way is email as well, and it's aldad at aldadlaw.com, A-L-D-A-D at A-L-D-A-D-L-A-W dot com. Very good. I am Victoria Rivadonera, and Real Estate Talk is heard every Sunday at 5 a.m. on New York's AM 710 WOR. It is also live streamed on 710WOR.com. You can also listen at your convenience by going to our podcast at retalkradio.com, where you can find information on all of our host uh, topics, blogs, and any other real estate resource that we have available for you from our show. Remember to like us on Facebook at Real Estate Talk. And if you're watching our live stream at facebook.com forward slash Victoria R-I-V-A, please like us there, too. Let us know that you're watching. Until next time, I'm Victoria Rivadonera, and thank you for listening to Real Estate Talk.